Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Connect 2021. I'm Jo, and I'm really excited for our next product demo because we're joined by the British Red Cross, one of the UK's leading first aid training providers, offering first aid, mental health and well-being, and health and safety courses for the workplace. They offer six short interactive mental health and well-being courses, ranging from two hours to one day in duration. These courses can be delivered virtually or face-to-face -to, -face to fit in and are designed to build both team and individual resilience and also to help staff members return and to maintain a state of positive mental well-being, which of course we're all looking for. If you have any questions during the presentation, put them in the Q&A box as always on the top right hand side. And I'll be joined live with Julie Anderson and James Reed afterwards to answer all of those questions. Hope you enjoy the presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing more about these courses and uh, we'll be back really soon. UK employers are facing a serious challenge for mental health related issues in the workplace, which is now the single biggest cause of absence amongst workers. An estimated 15.4 million working days are lost with over half a million workers suffering from work related stress, depression or anxiety. Not to mention an estimated annual cost to businesses of over £33 billion. For many of us, when we talk about mental health, a lot of other words come to mind mental well-being, welfare, mental illness and resilience. But what do these words really mean? And how do they impact and show themselves in our place of work? If we don't recognize the signs of distress in ourselves and others, it can affect our ability to maintain a positive state of well-being and health, both at work as well as in our home life. The Red Cross has a global reputation gained from its experience in providing emotional and practical support to individuals in crisis. At the Red Cross, we use a unique framework called Karma to help focus our responses when dealing with these emotionally challenging situations. This framework helps increase resilience to adverse and stressful situations so that we can bounce back to a positive state of mental well-being. Taking that expertise, we have developed a range of mental well-being and resilience courses specifically tailored for workplace settings. The courses aim to improve our ability to manage stress and build resilience for emotionally challenging situations in both our work and personal lives. It occurred to us that Aviva are dealing with customers who themselves have been through a trauma. So it, it makes perfect sense that the training we give our own people can be shared to other organisations like Aviva. My name is Martin Roach. I've been a claims consultant at Aviva now for eight years. The full day's training was excellent and I think the feedback from everyone who attended was superb. The day's training was broken down into various elements, uh, the first being psychoanalysis, and being able to um, appreciate what these people are going through and actually understand what they're going through. And it works all the way through the day, ending up with stress, how to deal with stress, and actually call upon other people if you are suffering. Since the training with the British Red Cross has started, we have seen an improvement, I think it's six, six or seven percent, um, in terms of customer satisfaction. We are giving them that, that emotional support as well, and this is why the guys really do need some support and guidance on how to build that resilience with, with our customers. We offer six short interactive courses ranging from two hours to one day in duration. The courses are designed for individuals and teams who want to develop the skills needed to help themselves and others when faced with difficult situations at work that are stressful, upsetting or challenging. This in turn leads to more engaged, motivated workforce, reduced absence, increased productivity and ultimately more satisfied customers. So first of all, KARMA, it stands for consider, and I will go through these in more detail in the next slides. It stands for consider, acknowledge, listen, manage, enable, and resource. Okay, so it's a nice, simple to remember acronym for people um, if they do need to provide this support to, to a first aider, to a witness, to anybody else in their workplace. So first of all, what we're considering is safety needs and risks. So. For those of you who've, who've done your first aid courses uh, for your workplace, you might compare this to that initial stage of dealing with a first aid incident where you, where you check for danger. Um, we're thinking about 
what's the appropriateness of dealing with this situation right here at the time? What's happening? Who's involved? Um, am I in the right uh, place like physically to actually deal with this? Do we need to go somewhere else? What situation are we in? How many people are going to be needing that kind of support? It's just about doing a broader kind of assessment of this situation before you get stuck into providing that psychosocial support. Think about the individual people's unique needs and wishes. So these could be cultural, these could just be things that you know about that person as their, as their colleague, somebody who maybe knows them quite well. We want to think, what do I reckon this person's going to need? What, what experiences do they have of this in the past? What could affect the way I give the psychosocial support? And also resources, thinking about, just thinking a bit ahead of what might help, what physical resources might they actually need, what can I really provide them with so that we're prepared to be able to do that. The next part, so we've, we've now considered everything that we need to, we're ready to start giving them that support in that situation. Um, really, we just want to encourage an open conversation. And throughout that, what's really important is this next part of acknowledgement. Okay, so we've been through something really difficult. It's so important to acknowledge what they've been through and acknowledge their feelings. And actually that's one of the most important things that you can do as somebody providing emotional support to somebody else. So it, it is shown that the acknowledgement by, by just saying, yes, I can understand why you're feeling that way. But, you know, if somebody comes to you and says that they feel really stressed about something, that something's had a real effect on them, to say, yes, that would definitely be stressful. I can really see why you're feeling that way. It can help to relieve that built up anxiety. It's that reassurance for people. It can establish a good supportive relationship between you and that person. And it can help to build up that empathy. Enabling people to help themselves. I think a lot of the time people are just really unsure about their feelings. Certainly immediately after an incident where those, those emotions are running really high, people often doubt their feelings and by just reassuring them that what they're feeling is normal and that you can empathize with it that can help them to think that bit more clearly because ultimately the, the main person who can help, help somebody is themselves and it can help to calm the brain and it can enable people to calm themselves and to regain the capacity to think so that's why that acknowledgement is really important and all the time you're doing that, you'll be doing this next part um, alongside it, really, this, this karma framework. It's not necessarily linear. It, it, it goes, um, you can go back and forth along it. But the next part is about listening actively. So active listening is a real skill, to be honest. And it's one of the key parts of providing psychosocial support to anybody. Um, I think it can be all too tempting, certainly when you're having a really long conversation, I'm sure we've all done it and we've all experienced it in the past, where you just start find yourself not quite paying as much attention as you were previously. And you know what, it's so important that we maintain that active listening. We really show that person that we are listening to them and we're understanding what they're saying. And to be honest, the main temptation that I think a lot of people have is when you're having a conversation with somebody, especially when it's quite a difficult conversation, there's quite a lot of emotions involved. They might be uh, displaying those emotions. They might be coming across quite emotional. It can be really uh, tempting to spend your whole time that they're talking, thinking about what you're going to say next. And I think we've all been guilty of that. And it comes from a good place in us. We don't, we don't want an awkward silence. We don't want to, to leave that person with uh, without a follow-up question. You want to know what you're going to say next, but it can take away from our active listening. And sometimes that shows um, so it's really important that we spend our time just listening to that person, listen to the story from their perspective. So say, listen actively, use questions appropriately. So you don't want to become too interrogative about it, but you do want to ask them a few follow up questions because think back to when you've been telling a story about something and how if somebody just asks a small question to clarify something, it really gives you that reinforcement that they are listening to you. And that's a really nice feeling. And be aware of body language and tone of voice. Uh, this kind of position here that we've got in the picture, actually, I, I really like that when you're having a conversation with somebody where you need to listen actively, that sort of L shape where it's a bit of a right angle. It's not too standoffish or confrontational, you're not face on with them, but um, it just enables you to still make that good eye contact, to have that posture to show that you're listening. Okay, so your posture, your body language, they all have an effect on, um, on, on how actively it shows that you're listening and your tone of voice as well. Next is just about managing that situation as it develops. 
course, thinking about this in the workplace context, we've, we've got to be aware there are professional boundaries here as well. Um, so thinking about confidentiality, you know, how much can we really promise them? Can we say that we won't share this with anybody or, or maybe there might be a need to? It's just about setting those expectations and continuing to manage those expectations and make them realistic as well. Um, and that includes managing your personal limitations. So if, if you are dealing with a colleague who's, who's been through quite a traumatic first aid incident, it might be a lovely thought to say, oh, look, here's my personal mobile number, give me a call any time, day or night if you need to chat. But we need to, we need to keep our own personal limitations throughout this and we need to, to be aware of our own mental well-being. So continue to manage that as that situation develops or part of the psychosocial the framework. This is about, you know, giving people, you've given them the chance to vent and that is shown to be a really good thing. There's nothing wrong with venting at all. Um, we're now going to start to think, okay, you've, you've, you said what you need to say. You, you've got these feelings out in the open. How can um, how can we now actually get you that help? And nobody's expecting you to be a counsellor or a therapist in these situations. All we're expecting is that you can help them to make their own decisions, to signpost to the appropriate places. And people often know their own support networks and what helps them. So what available options are there to them? Do you have in your workplace an employee assistance program? Can occupational health provide you with support? It's all these options. You could even just be thinking about who do they live with? Have they got family or friends who are quite good at listening and talking through things with them? Remembering what's helped them in the past. This is a really important one that people forget to do. But as uh, throughout our lives, we've all dealt with really difficult situations before and we all know to some degree what helps us. So just remind people to explore those things as well because it could help them this time. And making small decisions now helps with big decisions later. Simply making the decision, I'm going to talk to my, my partner or my spouse when I get home about this and I feel I want to have a conversation about it and how I'm feeling. That can just have set that person on the right track that they're now ready to talk about it. And later on, if they need that further support, they've already made that small decision that they're willing to talk. And lastly, resourcing them through information and liaisons. So where I've talked about things like employee assistance programs, occupational health, um, supply them with that information, anything that they might need and signpost to other sources of support. That can be um, external uh, mental health charities and support. That can be uh, their GP if they're really struggling. And not forgetting the basics either, transport, access to a phone or Wi-Fi. If your first aider in your workplace has just done CPR on somebody who they're, who they're really close with and that person's just gone to hospital and um, they're feeling really upset, distressed by this, are they in the right place to drive home immediately after? These are the things to consider. Just, just think about them, the basics. How, how else could that person get home? Could they be taken home, public transport, a taxi? It's just remembering to go through these things in your heads and make sure that you've, that you've covered off the psychosocial elements of it, the psychological, the emotional support, as well as the social side too. So that's the Karma framework. And um, it might seem in many ways like some parts of it are common sense, which is fantastic because that's how it's meant to seem. It's, it's a, none of it's supposed to be overly complex or difficult. It's just about facilitating a good conversation and a constructive conversation. And I think a lot of people when they're dealing with difficult emotions can freeze, panic, not know where to start. So karma is just a great way of, under, of people understanding where they could start with these conversations. Welcome back everybody and welcome to Connect 2021 and our live section today of our Q&A. I'm really pleased to be joined by Judy and James. Um, guys, it's fantastic to have you here. Now, if anybody's got any um, additional questions, pop them in the Q&A tab on the right hand um, top element of the screen. Now I've got loads of questions coming in. What a fantastic presentation. So what are the benefits of virtual training over face-to-face -face, and how have the virtual sessions been received by your clients? So I think that in terms of the virtual sessions, we have, we've responded to the changing environment that we live in. We've listened to our customers' needs and as a result, we've adapted our mental health and wellbeing training courses so that we can now deliver them virtually via video conferencing platforms. Um, in terms of benefits, um, it's, really, it's really beneficial that these courses are now accessible to all of those who are working from home or in an office so we can make sure that anybody who wants to access this training can, whether they're working from home at the moment or they are back in their office. 
Um, and it also creates a much more relaxed environment because these courses are about your, your own emotional well-being and understanding your own emotional state as, in order to be able to support uh, those around you and yourself. So that relaxed environment um, of being able to be in your own home, if you wish, is really good for enabling learners to feel comfortable when they're participating in some of those exercises. And in terms of feedback, I'll hand over to Judy for that part. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, thank you, James. It's been really well received. It's uh, the feedback that we've had has been quite overwhelming in that when people are so far apart and they're not in their offices and they don't see each other on a on a daily basis anymore, which was such a huge change for all of us, it was a way that people could be back together and share experiences, share how they've got on when we've all been locked in our houses, and still feel like we're part of a team and helping each other. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much for that. And actually, I hadn't really thought about the fact that you're so much more chilled when you're in a home environment. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. So do you think like moving forward um, that virtual training will be the norm? I think that um, it's very difficult to say at this stage. I know that lots of different workplaces are looking at various uh, arrangements, sort of post-COVID, as it were, as to what work-from-home arrangements might be. Um, certainly, if more people are uh, working from home or looking to reduce their travel, there absolutely could be a greater appetite in future for virtual training, and we're very much prepared for that. So from our point of view, we are prepared to return to a more face-to-face -face approach, or continue with the virtual approach as, as our learners and our customers wish for. I think yeah. to add, sorry, to add to that slightly, um, we've, got, we've all got a, a carbon footprint and there's companies who really are targeting that. So to keep people in their houses where well, we have that relaxed environment, as we say, can definitely be a benefit. It's like a win-win really, isn't it? To be honest with you. And actually we've all learned quite rapidly through COVID that we've got to go with what is thrown at us. Um, and it sounds like you guys are, so well done. So the next question is actually about something that quite high profile that happened over the weekend. Um, so the Christian um, Ericsson incident um, that happened in a football match. Um, so have you seen an increase in first aid and CPR training inquiries since that prominent issue? Well, we've definitely seen a lot more interest in um, helping somebody who's unresponsive and not breathing as, as Christian Eriksson was. Um, we've seen a lot more inquiries around, uh, can we put out videos on how to help, uh, on how to do CPR, how to use an automated external defibrillator or AED. And we do have a lot of resources around that already freely accessible and available on our website and our first aid apps, which are free to download. And equally, we're going to ensure that we are continuing to put out that content in as many places as are accessible. So lots of different social media channels. Um, we, we want people to see how to do CPR because it is something that is so, uh, so prominent in everyone's mind at the moment that it's so, so important that those who have seen this this um, incident and now feel that that's the thing that's pushed them to want to learn this really simple but really really important skill we're going to make sure that they absolutely do have uh, the ability to learn that and of course you can learn it through face-to-face uh, -face training courses as well especially in the workplace first aid context and I've actually done one of your face-to-face -face courses um, for CPR and it is absolutely outstanding and I tell you what the 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 um, confidence that it gives you going into different situations, especially if there is an emergency. Um, I can't stress enough how much people really need to, to put that in their belt of things that they have um, to be able to do, even if it's just not to be able, not to panic and to do the right things. Um, it's a fantastic training resource. So thanks guys. Um, so has the role of a mental health first aid changed over the last year, do you think? Um. I think that the I think that the things that people who are trained in mental health and well-being skills might be dealing with could be quite different um, over the past year. I think you know there, there is an increase in um, ne needing to be aware of our own mental health and the mental health of our teams too, um, especially with so many of us working from home, many of us almost completely isolated in working from home. There has been a huge increase in um, just awareness around the importance of mental health, I'll say, in the last year. So I think that the role itself 
is unlikely to have changed significantly. We've always equipped people who have attended our mental health courses to be able to deal with um, stress, anxiety, um, lowered resilience and how to improve that resilience. That's something we've always equipped people with, but I think the desire to uh, want to learn those skills has definitely increased. And I think the, the willingness of teams to embrace this as such an important thing in the workplace and outside has also increased. Definitely. Yeah, and thank goodness it has. Um, so you, do you think there should be maybe an independently governed qualification for mental health trainers, maybe just to align with the qualifications for the physical first aiders? Um, I think that we're definitely seeing um, ver various governing bodies um, viewing mental health as a, uh, with parity of esteem to our physical health, i.e. our first aid needs. And we're seeing that from the health and safety executive in terms of um, the, the pillars of well-being that workplaces should really be looking to, uh, to work towards there, to work towards having a really positive uh, mental health um, and well-being environment in their workplace. Um, so in terms of governing of it, it's something that could well come. We're, we're keeping a close eye on it. But for the moment, I'll say that the real benefit of the varied approaches is that you will still receive quality training, but you can really ensure that you are booking onto a course that is most suited to your, to your needs. And I think um, that as long as the trainers have the experience and the knowledge around mental health and well-being, you'll be able to get an offer that, that works for you. Which, of course, um, the British Red Cross do. So what other courses do you guys offer? In terms of uh, further training, we have uh, all the first aid courses, as you'd expect, all the HSE regulated ones, but also some quite bespoke ones that, that people might not know that we do. So uh, first aid for teachers, for sports events. Um, we do fire marshal courses, moving and handling courses. Uh, there's quite a range there. So hopefully there's something that will suit every industry. Do you do a family course? We do public training, so uh, baby and child. You'll know more about that, James. Yeah, absolutely. So when you say a family course, as in courses that whole families can attend? Yeah. So, um, so absolutely. So the British Red Cross, we have various ways of educating in first aid. Um, the courses that myself and Judy will be working with are primarily uh, for, for those aged 16 and over. Um, but we do include uh, topics around, of course, babies and children as well as, as required. Um, but we also have... Um, we do have youth workshops as well, which you can find out more about on our website. Our youth education teams absolutely do go out to, to primarily to schools and to work with young people to embed those skills very early on. And of course, um, it's worth mentioning at this point about first aid being embedded within the curriculum as of last September. So uh, even if you're not there learning it as a whole family together, your children will absolutely be learning it from primary school onwards. Yeah, and that is the best news ever. And I tell you what, the best way to educate parents and people in business is to, to educate the kids because then Absolutely. they come and tell you exactly what you have to do. <laughs> it's a huge benefit. Well, guys, um, that's it for the questions um, for today. Uh, thank you so much, Judy. Thank you so much, James. Um, with all of the courses moving forward, really enjoyed um, talking to you both this morning. Thank you all so much for the questions um, and being a brilliant audience. We hope you've enjoyed um, our talks. We've got one more left today, um, I'm pretty sure. And then another jam-packed day tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that and we're looking forward to seeing you then. Have a lovely rest of your day and take care.